it is my singular pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Eva Tolich. Eva is a professor and a group leader at the Laboratory of Cell Biophysics at RBI in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, she and our second speaker, Professor Nenad Pavin, have worked together on a number of fundamental questions in biology, including kinetical capture during mitosis, mechanism of tiny regulation in fission yeast, and replicative aging, or the absence thereof, in fission yeast. Um, for the past few years, Eva and Nenad have teamed up to understand forces in the mitotic spindle using a combination of experimental techniques and theory. And today they will take us through it. Uh, Eva, over to you. Thank you, uh, Vaishnavi. Uh, I want to thank all the organizers for the invitation and yes, especially to, to Vaish. Uh, and I have to say, I really like this idea of uh, having paired talks of experimentalists and, and uh, uh, theoreticians. So, um, Today will be the day of the mitotic spindle, and I will now tell you uh, about the experimental approaches to the uh, mitotic spindle, and uh, later Nenad will tell you about uh, theories that, uh, that he is developing for, uh, to understand the forces in the mitotic spindle. And I want to say that Nenad and I have been collaborating for, I think it's now 14 years, uh, on the problems of the cytoskeleton, motor proteins, the spindles, and similar uh, similar problems, and it's really great fun to have. A, uh, for an experimentalist, it's great fun and very very useful to have a uh, to have an excellent theory collaborator to work together. Okay, so let's start uh, to talk about the spindle. So this is uh, the mitotic spindle. What you see here, this is a human cell dividing. In green, you see the microtubules, and in pink, the chromosomes, and you see how this process looks when the cell divides. To me, this is a really super fascinating process, uh, and it's never boring to watch uh, these movies of cell division because you see how much dynamics and complexity uh, is here uh, during cell division. So the spindle forms, you can see it now, the chromosomes are moving around like crazy, then they get aligned at the so-called metaphase plate, and then in the end they get divided precisely into two uh, equal parts that then end up in the daughter cells. So this is the main task of the mitotic spindle, to segregate the chromosomes accurately, but unfortunately this doesn't always work so accurately, so uh, sometimes there, uh, there are errors in chromosome segregation and they can cause aneuploidy, which is a state with the wrong number of chromosomes. As you can see here, many chromosomes are present in some other number of copies than two, which is the wrong number. Two is the right number and everything else is the wrong number of chromosomes. And these uh, aneuploidy states are related to many serious diseases, especially to cancer. Most types of human cancers are characterized by aneuploidy uh, uh, in their uh, cells. And also aneuploidy is related to infertility and miscarriages. It's actually one of the most common uh, causes of these uh, of infertility and miscarriages, and it's also the cause of many uh, genetic diseases such as the Down syndrome. So these are the reasons, uh, more medical reasons, why it's important to uh, understand how the spindle works, because if we understand how the spindle works and how the spindle um, normally makes uh, accurate cell division, then we can uh, hope to be able to prevent uh, errors in chromosome segregation and related diseases. Okay, so the spindles are made of microtubules and microtubules are polymers of the protein tubulin. And on this animation, you see how uh, right now microtubules serve as tracks for motor proteins to walk along them. Here you see a kinesin walking along the microtubule and carrying cargo. Uh, these are other cytoskeleton filaments, and in the back you see the centrosome from which the microtubules uh, grow. This is a growing microtubule, and this is now a shrinking microtubule. And this is an important uh, characteristic of microtubules that they undergo microtubule dynamics. So they can be either in a polymerizing state or they can switch to depolymerization. And this switch is called the catastrophe. And the switch in the other direction is called rescue. And uh, this is a very important feature of microtubules because in this way, microtubules are able to uh, 
to uh, quickly change according to uh, change their polymerization depolymerization state according to the needs of the cell and signals uh, that the cell gets microtubules are not alone there are tens of different uh, um, enzymes working uh, on the microtubule so uh, we have already seen in this animation uh, motor proteins so kinesin motor protein that walks along the microtubule uh, some motor proteins walk towards the plus end and the plus end is the one that is uh, more dynamic that is constantly either growing or shrinking or sometimes pausing between growing and shrinking then there, there are other motor proteins such as dynein that walk towards the minus end and the minus end is the one that is less dynamic and in, this, in cells it's usually uh, embedded in the centrosome or somewhere else like close to a wall and of another microtubule then there are many other enzymes for example uh, here we can see uh, uh, microtubule spacing proteins they don't all have to be enzymes but microtubule associated proteins then we have the proteins that help uh, and accelerate microtubule polymerization then we have the proteins that bind to the to the end of the microtubule and regulate their growth and shrinkage microtubule severing enzymes that cut the microtubules so there is a whole bunch of proteins that regulate uh, microtubule behavior in general and another important player um, in the spindle story is the kinetochore the kinetochore here this part on the chromosome is a uh, is a protein complex on the centromere of each chromosome and it serves multiple functions so it's the main attachment sites of chromosomes to spindle microtubules and it's a hub for the spindle assembly checkpoint. So many spindle assembly checkpoint proteins bind to the kinetochore. And the spindle assembly checkpoint is the checkpoint that checks that all the chromosomes in the cell are properly bound to microtubules, such as this chromosome here, meaning that, uh, that the kinetochores on the sister chromatids are bound to microtubules extending from one pole on this side and the other pole on the other side. And only when such attachment, which is also called by orientation, uh, only when this attachment is achieved, only then the cell uh, passes this checkpoint and enters anaphase, which is the phase of chromosome segregation. And also the kinetochore is one of the main sites uh, where the force for chromosome movement is generated. And this force can be generated by microtubule depolymerization at the kinetochore or by motor proteins that pull the kinetochore uh, along the microtubules. So now when we put all this together, meaning the kinetochores and the microtubules, we get a textbook picture of the mitotic spindle. So here we see our chromosomes and kinetochores on them. And now there are several classes of microtubules in the spindle. Let's start with this one. These are called kinetochore microtubules because they grow somewhere from the region of the spindle pole and they end at the kinetochore. This is why they are called kinetochore microtubules. And the fiber, the bundle that they make is called kinetochore fiber or K fiber. Then we have all other microtubules uh, that are called non kinetochore microtubules and they can be divided into several groups. The first one is overlap microtubules. This means that these are the microtubules growing from one spindle pole and from the other spindle pole, and they overlap here in the middle. They form the so-called anti-parallel overlaps because uh, this microtubule has the minus end here and the plus end here, and this one has the minus end here and the plus end here. I should note that this is not electrical charge. This, this is just the plus and the minus is just the notation for the ends of the microtubules. As we have seen before, the plus end is the one that is more uh, that is more dynamic and the minus end is, is the one that is not so dynamic. So here we have microtubules uh, in the uh, anti-parallel configuration and several proteins prefer to bind in, this, uh, in these overlaps uh, where the microtubules have the anti-parallel configuration as we will see uh, later. And then there are some, uh, let's say more solitary, uh, solitary microtubules uh, so the so-called polar ones, these are the ones that grow from the pole and don't interact much with anything specific. Although I have to say there are so many microtubules in the spindle that probably all of them interact to some extent with the neighbors. 
And finally, their astral migrant tubules, these are the ones that grow from the centrosome towards the cell periphery, and they can interact with the cell cortex and help to position the cell. So this is a textbook picture of the single. And it comes from uh, work of many, many labs over more than 150 years. Uh, so the spindle has a really long history. And here you can see some historical drawings that Walter Fleming did uh, in around the year 1882. So already then he was able to see different phases of mitosis, as you can see here. He wasn't able to make the gif, but uh, he, uh, it is his drawings that, uh, that he, uh, uh, he drew by looking at the cells uh, through the microscope. And here you can see different phases of mitosis, prophase, then metaphase, anaphase, when the chromosomes separate, and uh, finally, uh, telophase. And even now, the pictures of mitosis look more or less like uh, he drew it so long ago. So there has been a lot of research on mitosis since then, uh, but we still don't completely understand how the spindle functions. And why is this? Well, the reason is that the spindle consists of several hundreds of types of proteins that contribute to the spindle assembly, uh, generation of forces, and regulation uh, uh, of the spindle's behavior. And so the problem is that there are so many players. And another problem is that these players have multiple interactions with each other and they many times uh, act in redundant pathways. So for example, here on this picture, you can see just the main classes of motor proteins. There are many more types of motor proteins that they're, they're, they're drawn here in the spindle. And for example, we see here the egg five. This is the kinesin five uh, family uh, motor protein, uh, one of the main, most famous uh, motors uh, in the mitotic spindle. And it, uh, its main function is thought to be the sliding apart of the microtubules in the overlap zones. So it's bound here and it slides, it walks towards the plus end of this microtubule. And these heads, it's a tetramer, these heads walk along this microtubule towards its plus end and thereby it slides this microtubules apart and helps to elongate the spindle. But the same motor is present also at the spindle pole. And actually, when you just look at the localization of egg five in the spindle, the majority of egg five is sitting here around the pole. And here, egg five is thought to cross-link parallel microtubules, uh, the microtubules in the parallel configuration. So this, this means that the same motor protein is doing uh, different uh, functions, uh, performing different functions at different locations in the spindle. So this is the reason why it's hard to interpret the phenotypes. Typically in biology, you study the, the, the role of some protein in a certain process by uh, depleting uh, or knocking out this protein or inactivating it. But if you inactivate a protein like this and you get the phenotype, for example, the spindle collapses, then you don't know why is this because this protein has several functions at several locations and it's very hard to uh, distinguish between these functions. Moreover, there are other proteins that do the same function as our first protein. So for example, here is the T15. It's also found in the antiparallel overlaps and it does almost the same thing as the egg five here in the antiparallel overlaps, meaning sliding the microtubules apart. So this is also a problem for the interpretation because if you inhibit egg five, you may not get any change in the spindle, not any visible phenotype. And then you may conclude, okay, egg five is not important. But this is not true because the reason why you don't see any change in the spindle may be that another protein is performing the same function together with, uh, with the protein that was uh, inactivated or depleted. So these are the, uh, the main reasons why um, uh, in spite of uh, a large, large number of studies and data on the mitotic spindle, we still don't know how the forces uh, are generated in different phases of mitosis and uh, how the spindle performs uh, its uh, different functions throughout the phases. And this is also a reason why we need theory because then uh, 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 we, can, we can take into account all these multiple players and multiple functions, propose certain models and then get some predictions that we can then test experimentally. 
So here I want to emphasize again that the forces are important in the spindle. So uh, why are forces important? It's because the spindle is basically like some kind of a mechanical micro machine that makes forces that move the chromosomes around because the final aim is to separate the chromosomes. This is done by basically moving the chromosomes apart. So the spindle has to produce these mechanical forces. And these forces are generated uh, in different directions uh, in different phases of mitosis. So for example, in prometaphase, which is the early phase when the spindle is just being assembled, the forces on chromosomes act towards the equatorial plane of the spindle. This is the equatorial plane and all the chromosomes have to move there. After this, uh, once the chromosomes are here, this is called metaphase, and then comes anaphase or chromosome segregation, when all these chromosomes now uh, move towards the pole. So the forces are acting in opposite directions in different phases of mitosis. And this means that the forces must be precisely regulated. Their direction and their magnitude must be precisely regula regulated in time over different uh, phases of mitosis. And this is something that we are trying to understand. So let me start uh, the story about the forces in the spindle by introducing uh, a certain paradox to you. And this is uh, a paradox that was dis discussed already in 2009 by Sophie Dumont and Tim Mitchison. And they said that uh, this was the classical force map in the spindle. So here we, we have a chromosome and kinetochore fibers. And everyone agrees that kinetochore, kinetochores are under tension. This is because there are many uh, laser ablation experiments that cut, for example, one kinetochore, and then the other kinetochore moves towards the pole. So you can conclude from this that kinetochores are under tension. And at the same time, the interpolar microtubules, these guys, the overlap microtubules that overlap and go from pole to pole, they are under compression, most likely because, because their shape is kind of curved. So this is a sign that there is something compressing them from the, from the ends. But actually, there are several um, experiments point, pointing in the direction that, that the kinetochore fiber itself is also largely under compression. And uh, one of them is also the observation that the kinetochore fibers are curved also, especially the ones uh, at the periphery of the spindle. So uh, these authors proposed that they uh, that, uh, proposed this revised force map in which the kinetochore fiber is under compression along most of its length and only under tension here close to the kinetochores. And the overlap microtubules remain under compression in this new force map. So this is a bit counterintuitive. How, how can we imagine that one single kinetochore fiber can be under compression and under tension at the same time? Um, so Fidumon and Tim Mitchison propose that there is a, there is a, a so-called spindle matrix element that would somehow uh, balance these forces. There is a long discussion about the existence of the, of the spindle matrix uh, in the spindle, which is uh, made of some other proteins than uh, microtubules and helps to, um, uh, to balance the forces in the spindle. So when we started looking at the uh, forces in the spindle, we first looked closely at the architecture of the spindle. So this is the spindle in HeLa cells. So this is a human cell, microtubules in green, kinetochores in pink. And this is a normal confocal microscopy image, just standard microscopy. And if you look carefully, you see that typically, um, you see that typically, if you look closely at the pair of sister kinetochores, you see their kinetochore fibers. This is uh, according to the textbook. Uh, so the kinetochore fiber goes to the kinetochore and this one goes here. But underneath, you see another green line, which is even easier to see here when we uh, have only the green channel. So these are the kinetochore fibers. And there is a thin green line uh, uh, going from one kinetochore fiber to the other, something like this. We, we thought this, this, is the, this structure looks like this. And we call this uh, new fiber, uh, which is made of microtubules because this is the tubulin signal here in green. We call it the bridging fiber simply because it looks like a bridge between two sister kinetochore fibers. 
So this was normal confocal microscopy. Then more recently, we used expansion microscopy. This is a type of a super resolution microscopy in which you don't need any new microscope, but you simple, simply um, you uh, label your sample, you embed it in a gel so that the labels are connected to the gel, and then, then you dissolve the sample and expand the gel. So you have an expanded sample, and then with the same normal confocal microscope, you can get uh, much better resolution. In our case, about two to three times uh, uh, higher uh, spatial resolution. And now on these images of spindles, we, we again clearly see our bridging fibers. So this thick line is the kinetochore fiber. Here would be a kinetochore. And here, this thin line that connects the two kinetochore fibers is a bridging fiber. And also uh, last year, uh, there, was a, there was a study uh, by electron tomography, uh, using electron tomography from uh, Dick McIntosh's lab, where they, uh, for the first time, observed uh, microtubules in human uh, non-cancer cells, uh, each individual microtubule. And what they saw well, is something very similar to what we saw in the light microscopy, only in much more detail and with much more complexity. So our model was like this, that we have kinetochore fibers ending, ending at the kinetochore, and we have these bridging fibers. So these are the microtubules coming from opposite sides and overlapping here in the middle and interacting with the kinetochore fiber laterally. And what they saw in electron tomography was something similar. So we have in yellow, the kinetochore fiber. One is here. Here would be a kinetochore. The other kinetochore fiber here. Here is a kinetochore. And then they saw a lot of non-kinetochore microtubules that look more or less like our bridging fiber, only a bit more messy because uh, your cell is definitely more messy than our uh, nice model. So uh, there are microtubules coming from one side. There are microtubules coming from the other side. They overlap in the middle, but also some of them end up in some other place. Some of them may, may uh, contact the, na the neighboring kinetochore fibers. But all in all, there is definitely a mechanical connection uh, between the sister kinetochore fibers made by microtubules. So, so far I have shown you different microscopy techniques that have uh, shown that there is this bridging fiber connecting the two sister kinetochore fibers. But microscopy in this case is not enough because microscopy just tells us that there, is, there are some microtubules lying close to the kinetochore fiber, but this doesn't mean that they physically interact. So to test their physical interaction, we uh, designed a laser cutting assay and it goes like this. So we will cut here the kinetochore fiber and then we expect that because, first of all, because of this curved shape of this whole unit of the spindle, we expect uh, this kind of response because after this compression is released, the, the fibers will straighten to some extent and move outwards. And if our bridging fiber, this line here, indeed interacts with the kinetochore fibers, it should move together with them. And if it doesn't, it was just a, if it was just accidentally close by, then the bridging fiber may remain where it was before and uh, the kinetochore fibers will uh, straighten. So let's see how it looks in the experiment. So this is our laser cutting. We are cutting just, we are cutting very gently. So we are cutting just a single kinetochore fiber uh, here. We see the response that we expected. So the, this fiber straightens, this part also straightens and depolymerizes. And when we look more closely at the still images from this movie, we see that, for example, if we look at the green channel, this is before ablation, everything is here uh, in one piece. Uh, there is the kinetochore fiber, the bridging fiber, and the other kinetochore fiber. And now after ablation, especially here, you see this part straightens, and it consists of the kinetochore fiber stub that was cut. The bridging fiber is still here, and the intact kinetochore fiber is here. So we have seen that the bridging fiber moves together with the kinetochores and with the kinetochore fibers after the cut. And this tells us that there is indeed a, a physical interaction between these fibers that they make one mechanical unit, they move together. So this means that the bridging fiber um, probably influences uh, uh, the forces that are acting on the kinetochore fibers and on the chromosome. 
uh, then we wanted to know what, uh, what is holding the bridge and microtubules together. And we found that this is the PRC1 protein. So the PRC1 protein is a cross-linker of anti-parallel microtubules. So we have one microtubule going, growing in this direction, the other one in this direction, and PRC molecules uh, bind uh, these kind of anti-parallel overlap zones. And PRC1 is, is, uh, is a well-known and well-characterized uh, cross-linker of anti-parallel microtubules. And we see it here in HeLa human cells uh, here in these pink lines, and these are our rigid fibers. Similar uh, uh, function and localization for PRC1 uh, uh, protein was found also in many other cell types. And uh, recently it was found, for example, in mouse oocytes. So it's not only, uh, the bridging fibers are not only present in uh, somatic cells, but also in, uh, in germ cells, in oocytes. Here you see PRC1 in green, very similarly to HeLa cells uh, in, the, in the central part of the spindle labeling the bridging fibers. So most cells that have been studied in this regard so far have shown that bridging fibers exist and that PRC1 uh, is binding the bridging microtubules together. And uh, so we wanted to then know uh, how the bridging fiber influences the forces uh, acting on the kinetochore fiber and on the chromosome. And for this, uh, we uh, developed a theoretical model and Menad will uh, tell you all about it uh, later today. And I will now show you just the result, our resulting picture, what is happening uh, in the spindle. So we have a bridging fiber here and this bridging fiber, now the compression in this bridging fiber is able to balance the tension on kinetochores and the compression uh, here close to the close to the close to the closer close to the so the kinetochore fiber in our model is under compression here in the region close to the spindle pole and under tension in the region between the point where the bridging fiber splits from the kinetochore fiber and the kinetochore so this is what our model with the bridging fiber kind of automatically gives you. And it, it's, a, it's a solution to the paradox that I had introduced uh, earlier. So uh, we don't need any other uh, non microtubule elements to balance these forces. Simply the bridging fiber that is observed uh, between the kinetochore fibers is able to, to uh, balance the tension on kinetochores and uh, 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 generate this kind of uh, um, force map in which there is compression and the tension at the same time along a single kinetochore fiber. Also, the, this uh, model illustrates you how the spindle shape is uh, maintained and generated, the curved shape of the spindle. And we illustrated this by making a, a real macroscopic uh, model uh, made of uh, wooden rods. So uh, here I want to illustrate to you just how uh, the existence of the bridging fiber uh, allows the spindle to get a curved shape. This picture shows you the textbook model without the, the old textbook model without the, uh, the bridging fiber. So we have two kinetochore fibers. There is one kinetochore fiber here. This is the kinetochore and this rope represents the chromatin connecting the two sister kinetochores. This is the other kinetochore fiber and now what whichever forces you exert on the ends of these kinetochore fibers, you cannot get the rounded shape that the spindle normally has. But if you put uh, a bridging fiber, so here we, we added another wooden rod and connected it laterally, glued it, we glued it laterally to this. Uh, so this is our bridging fiber, we glued it to one kinetochore fiber and the other kinetochore fiber. Now, if you apply forces, either compression forces or bending at the ends, you can get the curved shape of the spindle as, uh, as is observed in uh, normal cells. So uh, this is, um, uh, we propose that this is an explanation of how the spindle uh, uh, generates and maintains its curved shape, especially for the outermost uh, uh, microtubule bundles in the spindle. Now, how can we test this model, of, uh, this model that includes the bridging fiber? Well, one of the main predictions of this model is that if you cut the kinetochore fiber at different location, 
the locations, the result will be different. Any other model before the bridging fiber model does not predict such a thing. It always it predicts the same outcome with respect to the movement of the kinetochores, no matter where you cut the kinetochore fiber. And the bridging fiber model says, if you cut the kinetochore fiber here, meaning between the point where the, where the bridging fiber splits from the kinetochore fiber and the spindle pole, then the connection between the bridging fiber and the kinetochore fiber that is cut is going to remain there. So the bridging fiber will remain connected to both kinetochore fibers. It will be able to balance the tension on kinetochores. So the tension will remain, meaning the kinetochores will not uh, change their location much. Whereas if we cut the kinetochore fiber between the kinetochore and this point here, then the bridging fiber will disconnect from the uh, kinetochore fiber. And in this case, the, our model predicts there is nothing that can, that can balance the tension on kinetochores in this case. So the tension will uh, vanish and the kinetochores will uh, approach each other. In now this, uh, in, in this new state when there is no more tension on the kinetochores. And let's see what the experiment tells us. So to test this prediction, we cut the uh, kinetochore fiber many times at different locations. This is a general kind of response. This is a kinetochore to kinetochore distance over time, and the cut is done at time zero. So overall, the uh, distance between kinetochores goes down, meaning the tension is released to some extent. And now we plotted this data as a function of the microtubule stub length. So the, the length of the stub that remains after the cut or uh, it's equivalent to the, to the site, uh, to the distance between the kinetochore and the cut. And we plotted how much the interkinetochore distance decreased as a function of the distance from the kinetochore where the cut was performed. And we, we saw that the uh, interkinetochore distance decreased significantly more when the cut was close to the kinetochore, which is, according to our model, this, uh, the case when the bridging fiber gets disconnected from the, the kinetochore fiber. And the decrease was much, much smaller when uh, the kinetochore fiber was cut uh, closer to the pole. According to our model, this is the case when the bridging fiber and the kinetochore fiber remain, uh, remain connected. So this dependence on the decrease of interkinetochore distance on the uh, microtubule stub length or the location of the cut is consistent with the prediction of the model. And also similar results were, were observed later uh, by other labs. And this, is, this provides support to the, to the bridging fiber model that the bridging fiber exists and that it, that it indeed balances the tension acting on sister kinetochore. Recently, uh, Sophie Dumont's lab also performed a beautiful experiment with a microneedle in which they, they used the microneedle, they put it somewhere here, and they pulled on the kinetochore fiber with the microneedle in this direction. This is how it looks, uh, how the experiment looks. And what they saw is that uh, when they, when they uh, pulled uh, the kinetochore fiber away, the kinetochore fiber curved it pivoted around the uh, centrosome here, but there was no pivoting around the kinetochores. Here, this region around the kinetochores stayed uh, aligned. So there was a kinetochore fiber, bridging fiber, and the kinetochore fiber, they stayed aligned uh, during the experiment. And they concluded that there is reinforcement, mechanical reinforcement in the region near the kinetochores, and this is consistent with our bridging fiber. So this brings me to the new picture of the spindle that we propose. Uh, this is oversimplified, but just to remind you, uh, the old picture, the textbook picture says that there is a kinetochore fiber ending at the kinetochore and overlap microtubules that don't interact significantly with kinetochore fibers, at least in the central part of the spindle. And in our new picture, all the overlap microtubules are actually bridges between kinetochore fibers. They are, they are uh, uh, interacting closely with uh, sister kinetochore fibers and affecting the forces acting on kinetochore fibers and kinetochore. So they are balancing the tension on kinetochores and they are uh, allowing the curved shape of the spindle. 
And now is the time for my first pause because now we are um, uh, in between two parts of the talk. So, um, yeah, thanks, Eva. Uh, there are already a bunch of questions. Um, so I think there are a few questions from the introduction of your talk. Uh, maybe uh, if it's okay, we take a couple of those. And then there are a few questions about bridging uh, microtubules as well. So sure. the first question is from Pratyush. Uh, Pratyush, do you want to go and unmute yourself and ask the question to Eva? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my, my question actually was that uh, in the initial slides, you mentioned that the uh, Microtubules are so there are two uh, uh, sort of uh, you know depolymerization and polymerization happening. So my question is actually how is depolymerization of the microtubules leading to a force being experienced by the by the chromosomes at the kinet core? How is it becoming a force? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question, and this is also actually uh, uh, still a topic of research in many labs. The main idea is that there must be a coupler. So th there is a microtubule depolymerizing and there must be a coupler to the kinetochore. So in some cells, like in yeast, there is a ring, uh, a ring along the microtubule that is bound to the kinetochore. And as the kinetochore is depolymerizing, this ring is doing a bias diffusion towards the minus end and pulling the kinetochore with it. In other cells, in higher eukaryotic cells, there is no ring, but they are the so-called fibrils. So there is again a mechanical connection between the microtubule that is depolymerizing and the kinetochore. And the microtubule is, uh, as the mi microtubule is depolymerizing, it's pulling the kinetochore with it. And again, these fibril molecules are making a biased uh, diffusion because the depolymerizing microtubule is pushing them along the lattice of the microtubule towards the minus end. Okay, uh, my I hope this. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was able to understand that to some extent. My, uh, but my uh, another part of the same question would be that if so, microtubules are polymerizing and depolymerizing at uh, all times, even when they're not r related to the kinetochore, right, in the cell. So uh, the energy that must be uh, consumed by the microtubules to go to this uh, polymerization and depolymerization would be a certain amount. And if they have to now, in the case of kinetochores, pull the kinetochores into a certain direction, then the energy should increase. So that sh it should be a different, uh, probably uh, con con mechanism of consumption of energy or a different enzyme probably doing the depolymerization when it's happening near the kinetochore. So uh, let me just, uh, you are right. Um, and there are certain enzymes uh, promoting depolymerization. So uh, I don't know if you see, still see my screen. Um, yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so the point of energy is that there is a GTP tubulin and there is a GDP tubulin. So, uh, uh, so it's the, uh, this is, uh, uh, the, so, so the polymerization is uh, promote uh, the GTP tubulin is uh, polymerizing, and when the when the uh, phosphate is is uh, is gone and you have GDP tubulin, then uh, this this is a this conformation of the tubulin dimer promotes depolymerization. So then, okay. once the the uh, there is no more GTP tubulin at the uh, cap of the microtubule. This is the so-called GTP cap model of the microtubule. As long as there is GTP at the cap of the microtubule, the microtubule is growing. When this cap, because of the hydrolysis, is lost, then the conformation of the tubulin promotes the depolymerization of the microtubules. It promotes the curled state of the protofilaments and depolymerization of the microtubules. So this is uh, this is how. Uh, uh, this is where the energy comes from and how the conformation of the, of the tubulin dimer promotes the depolymerization. And as you mentioned also during mitosis and also during certain other processes, there are on top of that enzymes that sit here on the microtubule and promote depolymerization by taking away some of the, uh, uh, some of the tubulin dimers. And this definitely costs more energy than simply uh, uh, than this simple scheme. So there okay. is also the investment of energy during mitosis for the depolymerization. Okay, thank you. 
Thanks, Satish. A uh, couple more questions on the introduction, if you don't mind, Eva. So the next is by Atyab. Uh, Atyab, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so my question involves the egg 5 motor protein that you showed uh, in a cartoon. Uh, in which you said that uh, the two heads, the two heads on the opposite side of the protein, they identify which side is the positive edge of the tubule and they move. Uh, so the, uh, the tubules, the, inter the distance between them increases. Uh, how is the head identifying which side is the positive and which side is the negative of the tubule? Uh, so microtubule uh, has polarity that is visible even on the on the very small scale on the scale of a dimer. As you can see here, alpha there is alpha and beta tubulin. Alpha is here uh, in one green shade, and beta is in the other. Uh, basically, it means that that uh, even on the on the small small scale on the microtubule, when a motor lands on the microtubule, it can by binding to these different sides. Uh, kind of feel uh, in which direction the microtubule is pointing because there is alpha beta uh, tubulin dimer and then another uh, uh, another alpha beta but alpha beta is a dimer so then there is uh, another dimer and this is uh, how this local polarity is felt by the motors and this is then how they certain motors have uh, a preferred direction towards the plus end or towards the minus end. Okay, okay, thanks. It's all the polarity uh, of the microtubule that is uh, uh, that comes from the alpha beta dimers, which, which is eight nanometers. So this is the scale of the polarity. All right. Uh, also, in the new model, the overlapping microtubules are replaced by the bridging microtubules, right? So what is the purpose of egg 5 motor protein in the bridging microtubules? Because uh, in the center, the microtubules distance will increase and uh, supposedly would uh, decrease the, uh, the compression that's happening in the microtubule, right, in the bridge? Yes, that's what we think. And there will be much more about A5 uh, uh, later throughout the talk. So uh, um, maybe we can leave it to later, but you are absolutely uh, right. If it's doing like this, it is increasing the compression, elongating the spindle, increasing the compression, uh, doing something along these okay. lines. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I request uh, people asking the questions to maybe just uh, limit themselves to one question so that we have enough uh, opportunities for others to ask questions also. Uh, now we'll perhaps go to a couple of questions uh, about the bridging microtubules. Um, there was a question from uh, Yash. Uh, Yash, can you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question? Okay, so you propose a new model where you say that the bridging fiber is nothing but like a. My question is: Is the bridging fiber just a small piece of microtubule bundle which is stick to the interpolar fiber, or is it a complete pole-to-pole -pole fiber which is bundled together, like two different fibers bundled together? And even in the last schematic which you showed, like, do we just now take out the interpolar fibers completely out of the picture, or do they still exist independently? Uh, okay, again, excellent questions. Guys, the discussion is wonderful. I am very happy. So uh, the answer to your first question is something in between. So it's not that the bridging fibers are going from pole to pole uh, completely, but it's also not the case that they are just here. They are somewhere, maybe let me open this one. Uh, they are, they are uh, uh, starting somewhere along the kinetochord fiber here, 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 it, they're starting at different locations along the K fiber, most of them, and then they are going, uh, their plus sensors are somewhere here. So uh, let's say they have, they have a, some time when they're, uh, some region where they are growing along the kinetochord fiber and then they pass over to the other side and they don't all grow from the spindle pole. Actually very few grow from the region of the spindle pole. The majority is somewhere here in the middle. And your last uh, question, uh, so in, in normal human cells, it's exactly like you said, we just replace the overlap microtubules by bridging microtubules, basically we just move them. Uh, so it's the same microtubule, just their function is different. Previously, their function was just here to be in the middle and to produce these kind of forces. But now we say these same microtubules are interacting with, with kinetochore fibers. And we saw in human cells 
uh, normal untreated cells that uh, one, uh, each pair of uh, sister kinetochores, so each chromosome has one bridging microtubule. And we didn't see much, maybe one or uh, up to 3% of the bridging microtubules were alone without chromosomes. And maybe up to three chromos three percent of chromosomes were at any time point alone without the bridging microchip. Well, of course, this is a dynamic process, and at some moment in time, there may be, uh, uh, for example, a chromosome without the bridging microchip. But maybe uh, a bit later, uh, the new bridging microchip will attach or grow. But basically, uh, approximately, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between bridging fibers and kinetochore microtubules. So they are all like this, and there is no free bridging microtubule, uh, and there is no uh, free chromosome in this simplified view. Now, of course, in different treat, if you treat cells in a, in different ways um, by depleting certain proteins, then you can get. Uh, uh, free overlap microtubules or no bridges or different different situations. But in a normal situation in human cell, it's uh, uh, almost one to one between bridging fibers and chromosomes. Thanks, Eva. There's one question from Swarali that I uh, missed, I think. Uh, Swarali, if you could go uh, ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question to Eva. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so my question is, do motor proteins like EG5 necessarily require an overlap zone uh, so that they can attach to tubulin polymers of two different poles and slide them apart against each other? Or uh, can motor proteins work without an overlap region? Um, so they uh, most motor proteins can bind anywhere on a microtubule without the overlap region, but they have a preference to uh, some motors have preference to different parts. So for example, F5 is here on the, on the, in the overlap region, but it is also find at a spindle pole. And there is, to our knowledge, no real antiparallel overlap zone near the spindle pole. There is a parallel overlap zone near the pole, meaning microtubules growing in the same direction. So maybe it needs uh, uh, two microtubules of the, parallel orientation, but definitely we also see small uh, weak signal of uh, egg five proteins along also microtubules where we think there is no overlap whatsoever, parallel or anti-parallel. Uh, so um, uh, these kind of motors will bind anywhere, but they will prefer and accumulate certain uh, zones such as egg five prefers anti-parallel zones. And regarding the function, if uh, we think its function is to slide microtubules, then it can do its function only if there is an overlap zone to slide something uh, with respect to the neighboring microtubule. When it's alone on a single microtubule, it just walks to the plus end. But uh, uh, we currently don't think that this is its function to just walk to the plus end. But maybe it's the way to get to the overlap zone. Thanks, Eva. So uh, again, going back to bridging microtubules, um, there are a couple of questions. So maybe I'll just pick a couple. Um, apologies if I don't pick your qu specific question. So Saptarishi, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Hi, uh, hi. Uh, so actually, I was wondering what happens uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the case of meritogenic attachments. How the force map defined by the bridging fibers work in the case of meritogenic attachment? Uh, that's a great question, uh, and we have been thinking about this a lot because it looks like uh, the bridging fiber could be bad in the sense that uh, it could promote meritogenic attachments. Because, for example, here it's closed. So let me first explain uh, what is a meritogenic attachment. A meritelic attachment is when one kinetochore is bound not only to the microtubules from the pole on, on that side where it should be bound, but also to the microtubules from the other pole. And if you have a bridging fiber, it could just this, this, this microtubules of the bridging fiber could bind to this kinetochore here, and then this kinetochore would be meritelically attached. And this is bad. This kind of kinetochores then have uh, errors in segregation afterwards. Uh, this is a possibility. Only uh, theoretically, it's a possibility in principle, but we haven't seen this. We we okay. think that uh, uh, yeah, we 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 haven't seen any any meritelic attachments uh, 
uh, in normal untreated cells. And every pair of kinetochores, like more than 97% pairs of kinetochores have a bridging fiber. And we think the reason is that uh, simply this, this bridging fiber is uh, interacting laterally with the kinetochore fiber, and it's not uh, interacting directly with the kinetochore. Um, so somehow it's making the overlap zones uh, with the microtubules coming from the other side and not uh, directly uh, end on or laterally. Uh, we don't think there is any direct interaction between the kinetochore and the bridging fiber. Thanks. A um, couple Thank more you. questions, um, and I promise that's it, Eva. But uh, there's one question from RS. Uh, I don't know what their full name is, but the initials are R and S. Uh, can you go ahead and ask your question? If not, I'll just read it out for you. Uh, are there specific proteins which are known to reside at the microtubal branching point, and have there been experiments looking at perturbations of these proteins? Okay, this is also a great question. Uh, so, yes, uh, but there are two kinds of, let's say, branching points that we are talking about here. The first branching point would be, which is not drawn here, would be the point where the bridging fiber microtubule is nucleated and the first time it kind of branches off from the kinetochore fiber. This would be along in this region and there is the Ogmin complex uh, that is important for this. So the Ogmin complex is the complex that is sitting along the pre-existing microtubules, and it's a nucleation complex that nucleates new microtubules. So this is the branching point for the, for the bridging microtubules to nucleate, to exist in the first place. And when you perturb this, uh, this protein, then there is much uh, fewer microtubules in the bridging fiber. The tension on kinetochores is smaller and uh, a lot of other things happen. So this is the branching point of the uh, where the bridging microtubule uh, starts to nucleate from the kinetochore fiber. The second branching point is basically this one here, when the bridging fiber splits from the uh, from the uh, uh, kinetochore fiber, and we think currently that this point is uh, somehow determined that there is no specific protein sitting only here. We think. So we think that there is a cross-linking of the kinetochore fiber and the bridging microtubules all the way while they are parallel to each other. And the main cross-linker is the NUMA protein. So when you, uh, Sophie Dumont's lab has shown that when you deplete the NUMA protein, which we all think is the cross-linker of kinet oops, <laughs> kinetochore fiber and bridging microtubules, then she got the result that that when she cuts the kinetochore fiber even, even further away from the kinetochore, she gets the decrease of the distance of the kinetochore. This means that the, this point has moved, when you deplete NUMA, more close to the pole, meaning NUMA was important for the uh, cross-linking of kinetochore fiber and the bridging fiber. And also, I will show you later, um, uh, when we deplete NUMA, we get different, uh, we get less connection between kinetochore fiber and the bridging fiber in the sense that uh, bridging fiber is sliding and kinetochore fiber is sliding less if you don't have NUMA and if you have NUMA, they slide more together. So uh, NUMA is one of the main crosslinkers, but it, it doesn't sit here. I think this point here is probably determined by the forces and by the geometrical, spherical constraints that the bridging fiber simply cannot go all the way to the kinetochore, but there is about one micron here when this last crosslinker uh, crosslinks because simply the bridging microtubule cannot come so close to the kinetochore because of the kinetochore and the chromosome and because of the forces. In this case, if you have a compressed element, then this thing goes up and this thing stays here. So there is, there is this uh, gap here. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. So we'll take one last question before you continue the talk. Maybe we can ask Aprutim. Uh, hey, Aprutim, can you unmute yes. yourself? Yeah. yeah. So, Eva, I was just wondering what happens to the bridging fiber, fiber in anaphase. Do, do all the bridging fibers let go at the same time and then tension takes over? Uh, uh, a great question. There will be a part of my talk about anaphase. So bridging fibers are there and they're sliding and they're helping anaphase. Uh, and we will see this. Uh, um, cool. Um, third part of my 
Thanks, Eva. We will let you continue with your talk. Uh, for the others whose questions haven't been asked yet, uh, do go to the Slack channel that we have dedicated for this session and ask whatever questions you have for Eva. And I do hope Eva has some time later on to maybe answer those questions on Slack. Thank you. I surely will answer all the questions <laughs> during the day today. Uh, thanks, thanks for a great discussion. Your questions are right to the, uh, to the point. Uh, this is wonderful. Uh, okay, but I don't think I will be able to, to do even half of my talk. Uh, okay, uh, we are going on. So now the next question that we will be talking about is the uh, alignment of the chromosomes in the middle of the spindle. So as we all know, the chromosomes are in metaphase, nicely aligned at, in, in the mid plane, in the equatorial plane of the spindle. And to do this, they have to do two things. They have to congress, meaning move to the equatorial plane. And at the same time, they are becoming bi-oriented, which means that they are attached to the microtubules from the, from the opposite poles. And then you get a structure like this. And it is still not clear how the cell manages to do this and, and make such a nice uh, aligned uh, structure. Now, first of all, this is biologically important to have the chromosomes aligned at the metaphase plate, because if you don't, if you lose the chromosome alignment for some reason, then the chromosomes are not segregating in a synchronous way and you get lagging chromosomes. Usually you don't get a, a real chromosome segregation errors that you get an euploidy and the wrong number of chromosomes in the cell, but what you get is abnormal nuclei for the next interphase uh, and so on, and also micronuclei because this lagging chromosome, if it, if it arrives to the pole region uh, uh, too late, then there will be a big nucleus and the micronucleus, which is definitely bad for the uh, next phase and DNA replication and, and so on. So, uh, it's important to have the chromosomes aligned at the metaphase plate. So there are a whole lot of forces acting on chromosomes during metaphase. This has been a, a, a field of research over many decades and a lot is known and a lot is happening there. So this is just a scheme to, to kind of uh, briefly tell you what is going on with, on the chromosome. So first of all, there is a pulling force acting on the kinetochore by the kinetochore microtubules, as we discussed before. And uh, the main proof that it's like this is if you cut one kinetochore, the other one moves towards the pole. Then at the uh, kinetochore, there is mainly microtubule polymerization. Uh, so microtubules are polymerizing here pre pre uh, predominantly. Sometimes there can also be some uh, short periods of depolymerization, but mainly there is polymerization. And you can see this if you label uh, tubulin uh, in a certain way. And then uh, you see that this new label tubulin incorporates near the kinetochores. Then there is something called poleward flux. This means that the whole microtubule, if uh, the whole, uh, all of the microtubules, are undergoing flux in the direction of the pole. This is like a conveyor belt. So the whole lattice of all of these microtubules is moving, oops, is moving towards the pole. And you can see this experimentally if you do photoactivation or photoactivatable GFP tubulin, for example, if you photoactivate, if you mark your microtubules here across all the kinetochore fibers, after some time, you will see your marks closer to the pole. So everything is moving towards the pole on one side and the other side. Then there is the elastic force between the kinetochores. So the chromatin here between the kinetochores has some elastic properties. Um, and by these pulling forces, it's been stretched. And we know this because if you depolymerate microtubules, or as we have seen in the laser ablation experiments before, uh, if you cut the microtubules or, or uh, remove them in some way, the kinetochores come closer together. This is because of the elastic force. <laughs> Okay, and then finally, the chromosome arms are not just there. The chromosomes, are, chromosome arms are these regions of the chromosome, and they are not just uh, sitting there passively. They have motor proteins, the so-called chromokinesins, attached to them, and they can walk on the microtubules. So whenever there is a microtubule coming to the chromosome arm, a motor protein can catch it, and these motors walk towards the minus, towards the plus end. Sorry. So thereby they push the chromosome away from the pole. And this is called the polar ejection force. 
and you can move clearly see the polar ejection force if you cut off a part of the chromosome so that only this arm part is left and then you see that this this arm moves away from the from the pole uh, where from the closer pole uh, away due to these motors that that uh, move the chromosome arm along the microchannels so this was the summary of the forces um, accepted in the prevailing view of the of the chromosomes during uh, during metaphase and you see how complex it is and a lot of things are things are moving with respect to each other everybody is moving with respect to everybody else and it's quite um, it's quite exciting I have to say and now some molecular players uh, so these processes that I have uh, uh, shown you now are um, are um, regulated by different molecular motors and other enzymes so the the on the kinetochore there are several motors that regulate microtubule polymerization and depolymerization uh, for example kif 18 a uh, suppresses microtubule polymerization clasp promotes polymerization and keg promotes depolymerization so they're always opposing enzymes at the same place opposing each other and then somehow the final uh, balance between all these activities is uh, visible in the cell at the spindle pole there is a motor from the kinesium 13 family depolymerizing the minus end which helps this flux of the whole microtubule towards the pole it has to depolymerize here otherwise the spindle would grow if there was no depolymerization then on chromosome arms we have seen there is the protein called kid which moves the chromosome arm along the microtubule and there is also KIF4A, which uh, suppresses microtubule polymerization. And microtubule polymerization itself can push the chromosome arm away from the pole. And within the bridging fiber, there is whole lots of proteins. So there is PRC1, which is the cross-linker that we have mentioned before, that cross-links the microtubules together. It has a binding partner KIF4A. It's actually the same guy like this one here, but uh, so KIF4A is in two different locations. Here, the KIF4A in the bridge moves towards the plus end of the microtubule, and here it suppresses polymerization and thereby it controls the length of the bridging microtubules. Similarly, KIF18A also moves to the plus end and suppresses polymerization. Egg5 is here and uh, doing the sliding of the microtubules and SEMP E is also here in the overlap zone uh, and sliding uh, microtubules apart. And these are only the proteins that have been studied so far with respect to their localization and function in the bridging fiber. And we expect that there will be surely tens more kinds of proteins here in the bridging fiber uh, doing different uh, functions in sliding and in regulation of microtubule dynamics. Now, how can all these activities lead to the centering of chromosomes uh, in the uh, equatorial part of the spindle. And here, uh, these are probably my favorite slides of this part of the talk. Here, I will introduce to you the concepts, how something can be centered on the spindle. So there are three uh, types of centering mechanisms. The first one is based on the length dependent pushing forces. So in any case, if you want to center something, something has to be length dependent because you have to know where you are to regulate the, the force depending on the length, length of the microtubule or distance from the pole or distance from the equator. So here, is, uh, here we have length dependent pushing, pushing forces exerted by microtubules. And there are three reasons why these forces are length dependent. The first one is if you have an isotropic aster of microtubules, so microtubules going isotropically from a centrosome, then simply the microtubule density will be smaller if you go further, uh, further away from the centrosome. Here, in close, close to the centrosome, there will be many microtubules uh, bumping into some area, and further away, there will be less. And this actually goes as uh, one over distance from the centrosome squared. Then there is another effect, and this is that the microtubules are not all of equal length. Because of the dynamic instability of microtubules, their length distribution is roughly exponential. And this is then something that makes it even more so that there are many, many more microtubules bumping into an area close to the centrosome and very few long ones uh, far away. 
And finally, there is also the critical or Euler force, uh, which is the critical force at which the microtubule buckles. And for a short microtubule, this force is larger. So the short microtubule has a larger force pushing on some object than the long microtubule. So because of all these three effects together in the spindle, we have higher pushing forces close to the centrosome and, third, and uh, uh, smaller forces far away from the centrosome. So this means if you have two centrosomes, then uh, the chromosomes will be pushed away from both poles towards the equator. Then another type of centering mechanism has to do with microtubule dynamics. So uh, we have seen the different enzymes, motor proteins, they uh, regulate microtubule dynamics. And now if you want to center something, you have to regulate the microtubule dynamics in a length dependent manner. Again, you have to measure, the motors have to measure the length of the microtubules to be able to center something. And there are motors that can do this. So for example, if you have a chromosome that is displaced towards one side, then you have a shorter microtubule on this side and a longer on this one. And there are motors such as, for example, calisin 8 that have the following property properties. They bind anywhere along the microtubule. So the longer microtubule will accumulate more motors than the shorter one. These motors walk towards the plus end and for, uh, for this uh, uh, mechanism, the motors have to be highly processive. Processive means that they walk uh, long distance be, without detachment. So these motors must, uh, must be able to walk a long distance uh, of a length of this microtubule, which is almost 10 microns without detachment. This means that the long microtubule will then accumulate at the plus end more motors than the short one, because all of these guys who bind here will move to the plus end. And then these motors uh, somehow affect microtubule dynamics. And for kinesin-8, it has been shown that kinesin-8 can do different things. In vitro, on stabilized microtubules, it can uh, regulate the depolymerization rate so that the longer microtubule, because it has more motors, has a higher depolymerization rate. It shrinks faster. Then this was in vitro on stabilized microtubules. Then there was a study in fission yeast cells in vivo. And here they measured that, uh, that the catastrophe frequency was higher for microtubules of a uh, longer length. So the motors accumulate here and they induce catastrophe. So the switch from growth to shrinkage of this microtubule. And there was a study on dynamic microtubules with human uh, kinesin-8 motors. They saw, uh, they didn't see so much catastrophe or depolymerization, but they saw that the microtubule starts to pause. The longer the microtubule, the more time it spends in the pausing state. Pausing is not growing, not shrinking, just pausing. Uh, so overall, even though there are differences, whether you do in vitro experiments in certain way or in which kind of cell you look, whether it's yeast or, or uh, human cells, in, uh, there is one thing in common. In all of these cases, kinesin-8 suppresses microtubule, further microtubule growth, either by inducing depolymerization or catastrophe or pausing, but it, it uh, suppresses further growth. And this is good for the centering because if there is a lot of motors here and they suppress growth, then uh, this microtubule will not have a suppressed grow, so growth. So this one will be able to grow and this one will start to shrink and the chromosome will move to the center. Okay, this was the second mechanism. And the final mechanism is the length dependent pulling forces. Pulling forces can also be length dependent if you have a situation like this. There is a kinetic or microtubules on this side and on this side. And if they are bound along their length to something which could be a microtubule or could be something else, could be some other filament or, or some other structure, then there is a longer length on this side, which then can accumulate more motors that are able to slide the kinetic or microtubule with respect to this structure here. And more motors means more force. And the total force on this chromosome will depend almost linearly, uh, presumably, on the length difference uh, between this longer side and the shorter side. So the length difference will make the difference in the number of motors. This will make the difference in the forces. And the net force will be in the direction, oops, in the direction of the longer microtubule, meaning towards the spindle center. This part has not been uh, explored yet in the spindle. 
The pushing forces in the microtubule dynamics have, uh, are well documented in the spindle, as I have shown you before, but the length dependent uh, pulling forces have not been explored. And we wondered, because we have our bridging fiber, do we have length dependent pull pulling forces here in the spindle? And do they somehow uh, affect the alignment of the chromosomes at the metaphase plate? And the first experiment that we designed to, to uh, start answering this question was to remove the bridging fiber acutely. The problem with most uh, experiments in cell biology is that most uh, perturbations, biological perturbations, depletions of proteins are done over many days and then the cell can enter mitosis and build a spindle without a certain protein and it can compensate this by, for example, overexpressing other proteins uh, in some other way. And then uh, sometimes there is no effect on the spindle, even though some protein is missing, because the cell had time to compensate for it. This is why uh, now the field is moving in more acute methods to remove the protein, meaning you have a nice spindle and then acutely you remove a certain protein. And there are different ways to do this. We designed an optogenetic uh, way uh, to remove the protein. Optogenetic means that you control some uh, uh, protein activity or localization by light, or you, co you combine optics because you will shine some laser light, and genetics because you have to genetically modify uh, your cell. So our uh, design of our experiment was like this. We want to remove our PRC1 protein that binds the bridging microtubules together to, to, to disassemble the bridging fiber. We bound our protein to RFP, red fluorescent protein to C, and to SSPB, which is a protein, bacterial protein, that binds to the peptide, peptide, peptide called SSRA, which is bound to the LAV2 domain, and this is a light-sensitive domain, and all of this is bound to the cell membrane. So the idea is, when we shine blue light, the LAV2 domain changes its conformation, it kind of opens up, and now it allows for binding of this part to this part. And this, our protein is undergoing turnover, it's binding and unbinding to the microtubules, in which eventually it will be sequestered by this binding to the cell membrane. And this is how the experiment looks. So you see our PRC1 protein in pink, this is the one that we want to remove, and the kinetochores are in blue. Uh, the blue light was uh, started in the beginning of the movie, and you see how the whole protein has moved to the cell membrane. Now at 20 minutes, now we switch the light off and the protein comes back. I will play it once again. Uh, now when it comes uh, zero time, which is now we start removing the protein. So you see it's still on the spindle, but it's moving to the membrane. There is less and less PRC1 pink protein on the spindle and more and more on the cell membrane. So now we removed almost all of it. After 15 minutes, we removed almost all of it to the membrane. And when we switch the light off, it unbinds from the membrane and comes back to the spindle. So this is the beauty of the optogenetic experiments that they are so fast and reversible. When we measure the PRC intensity on the spindle, we see that the half time of removal is about four minutes. And when we switch the light off, it comes back within less than a minute. So this is very fast meaning we can do this experiment at any phase of mitosis that we want after the spindle has been uh, uh, normal, on a normally formed spindle. And it's reversible, so we can see what is happening when, when the protein comes back. But anyway, our question for, for this talk is uh, whether the removal of the PRC1 protein uh, um, um, made some effect on the alignment of the chromosomes. So we measured the distance of each of the kinetochores from the metaphys from the equatorial plane or the mid plane of the spindle. The mid plane would be somewhere here. So in the dark, when everything is normal, you see that the kinetochores are all more or less nicely aligned. And after 20 minutes of uh, exposure to light, when PRC1 protein is gone, then we have much worse alignment. And we measured this, and we see indeed that uh, the distance to, to the uh, mid-plane increased significantly after we removed the PRC1 protein. So why did this happen? It's not uh, simple. Uh, the, the explanation is not straightforward because I have shown you before that we have several processes acting on the chromosome and there could be many reasons why chromosomes become misaligned. But they, they come into three uh, main groups. The first one is the, uh, maybe it's something with the bridging fiber. 
The second one is maybe something happened with the kinetic or fiber. And the third reason may be that there is something with the, with the uh, polar ejection forces. So let's look at the one by one. First, we measured the bridging fiber intensity before and after PRC1 removal. And we found here is the, uh, here is the tubulin intensity before there was quite some intensity in, of tubulin in the bridging fiber. And afterwards, this intensity was much smaller. So indeed, we did partially or to a large extent disassemble the bridging fiber. We, we reduced the number of microtubules in the bridging fiber by removing PRC1. Okay, this is what we wanted to do, so this is good. Now let's see the other things. Did we perturb something on the kinetochore fiber tip? We looked at the proteins, uh, uh, typical uh, candidates for the, uh, for the activity on the, on the uh, plus end of the kinetochore fiber. We labeled, with, we, we labeled them with the GFP and performed our optogenetic experiments in which we removed PRC1. And we saw that both in the dark and in the light after PRC1 is removed, these proteins remained on the kinetochore fiber tips. So we concluded most likely kinetochore fibers are not affected. And the polar ejection forces, we labeled kit 4 a which is a binding partner of PRC1. And it was a, possib a reasonable possibility that by removing PRC1 to the cell membrane, as we see here, PRC1 in pink removed from the spindle to the cell membrane, there was a reasonable assumption that also kit 4 a uh, would be removed from the spindle to the cell membrane. But when we looked at the kit 4 a signal, it was not so. It remained on the chromosome arms. So based on this, we think that it's not likely that the polar ejection forces were affected by our removal of PRC1. So we think it's the bridging fiber. And what does the bridging fiber do? Well, we wanted to look at whether there is something uh, with the regulation of the bridging fibers themselves uh, going on after the PRC1 removal. And to do this, we use cells in which EB3 protein, which labels the growing ends uh, of microtubules, uh, uh, is labeled. And you can see here, so these, these fireworks of these spots, this, these are the growing plus ends of microtubules. And by following each of them within the bridging fiber, we measured the length of the bridging fibers before and after removal of PRC1. And we found that the length of the bridging fiber, so the length of this whole overlap zone, increased after we removed PRC1. And this is because, uh, I'm not showing you these experiments, but this is because with removal of PRC1 from the bridging fiber, we remove the regulators of microtubule dynamics from the bridging fiber, and this results in longer overlaps. And we thought that this has to do something with something. So we think that there is a, a length dependent pulling force here and here, and somehow the longer overlap, overlap will generate longer forces that will then help the chromosome go to the cell center. And it's important that this whole overlap uh, between the bridging fiber and kinetochore fiber is reasonably short because then the relative difference between the, the overlap on one side and the other side will be larger than if you have a super long overlap, then the system will probably not feel small excursions of the chromosome. That was our kind of idea. And we developed a, a physical model for this. And Bernard will tell you all about it later uh, today. And I will just uh, show you some schemes to, to uh, explain the concept, what we think is happening here, and how this system is able to center the chromosomes. So I have mentioned the overlaps uh, so far many times. And there are two kinds of overlaps that play a role here. The first one is drawn on this scheme here. So we have kinetochore fiber in light green and bridging fibers in dark green. There are parallel overlaps between bridging microtubules and kinetochore fibers. They are labeled here in brown. So you see on the right side, we have the kinetochore fiber pointing in this direction, and we have this bridging microtubule pointing in this direction, and they have over an overlap in the parallel configuration all along the uh, K fiber as it's, as it's drawn in this simplified scheme. And this is where the cross-linkers of parallel microtubules cross-link these microtubules. As we said before, this is the, uh, the, the main protein is NUBA. 
On the other side, we again have parallel uh, overlaps. There is the kinetic core fiber, and now it's a parallel overlap. It has a parallel overlap with this bridge in the microtubule, and the parallel overlap is again as long as the kinetic core fiber itself. Why are these in, uh, overlaps important at all? Because we have a bridging, bridging microtubules here, the dark green ones, and they have sliding motors between them. These motors slide the bridging microtubules apart so that this microtubule is moving to the left. And because of these cross linkers, it's moving the, the left kinetochore fiber also to the left because of this friction force that is generated by the cross linkers. The same on the right side. So we have this microtubule moving to the right because of the friction force, uh, the, this uh, kinetochore fiber is also moving to the right. But the longer the overlap, the more cross linkers and the higher will be the friction force. So uh, uh, this is what we think is happening. We have a higher friction force in the long parallel overlaps than in the short ones and the net force, the net friction force will be to the right, meaning to the center. Okay, now we have also anti-parallel overlaps. So now we are looking at these brown regions. These are the anti-parallel overlaps between bridging fiber and K-fiber. So we have this kinetochore fiber, and now it makes the anti-parallel overlap with this bridging fiber. This is the anti-parallel overlap, which can accumulate sliding motors just in the same way as the anti-parallel overlap of bridging fibers. Oops. And we have also the anti-parallel overlap on the other side. So this is the kinetochore fiber, and it has anti-parallel overlap with this bridging microtubule. So these motors are sliding, not anymore the bridging microtubules with respect to each other, but they are now sliding the kinetochore fiber with respect to the bridging fiber. They are pushing this kinetochore fiber to the left and this kinetochore fiber to the right. Again, if the chromosome is displaced to the left, then there is a larger overlap region on the right, meaning more motors, and these motors make a larger force, this sliding force, which uh, then uh, wins over these motors and the net force by the motors is to the right. So these are the two reasons why such overlaps can lead to center. And now the main uh, prediction or let's say the signature of this kind of model is that the kinetochore fiber should slide towards the pole at a different velocity than the bridging fiber because the bridging fiber, our model is the main slider. The bridging microtubules slide apart in any case by themselves, I mean, by the motors that are here. And the kinetochore fiber, uh, this, this force from the bridging fiber is transmitted to the kinetochore fiber. So the kinetochore fiber should slide towards the pole at a velocity that is smaller than the velocity of the bridging fiber. This is the main uh, prediction of this model. And this is something that has not been uh, explored in the, in the literature. Uh, the polar flux, the flux of the microtubules has always been thought, at least for human cells, that it always goes uh, at the same velocity for all the microtubules. So how can we distinguish this? If you photoactivate a certain part of the spindle, you photoactivate all the microtubules that are in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in this zone of photoactivation, which is at least a micron large we decided to develop a speckle microscopy assay for human cells. Speckle microscopy um, uh, has been uh, um, designed a long time ago by Claire Waterman Storer, and it works in a way that if you can have speckles on the lattice of a cytoskeleton filament, for example, on the microtubule, then you can follow these speckles and you can see where your filament is moving. And we achieve this by using a very small concentration of sirtubulin, the dye that binds to uh, microtubules. And wh what you can see in these movies, each of these white spots is one speckle on a single microtubule. This is just a couple of dye molecules within a diffraction limited spot on a single microtubule of its lattice. And it's showing you the movement of this microtubule. And in addition, we have kinetochores here uh, in red. And now, we decided to follow these spots. I was sorry, uh, five more minutes yes. uh, for the talk, is that all right? How many? Five, <laughs> because we oh, have it. Okay, <laughs> it's gonna be exactly <laughs> half, <laughs> fine. <laughs> so, 
so uh, so we decided to follow uh, uh, specifically uh, speckles on either a kinetochore fiber on the or the bridging fiber. And for the kinetochore fiber, we uh, define the spots on the kinetochore fiber as those that appear close to the kinetochore. As you can see here, this is a spot that appears close to the kinetochore, and over time, this is our spot that we are following. It's moving towards the pole while kinetochores are doing whatever they're doing. And the spot on the bridging fiber we defined as the one that is starting somewhere uh, away from the kinetochore, passing the region between kinetochores and going towards the other side. And this would be such a spot. There is a spot here. It's passing through the region of the kinetochores and ending on the other side. And when we follow a lot of these spots, we indeed measure that the spots on the bridging fiber move on average at a higher velocity than the spots on the kinetochore fiber. And this, is, um, this gives us confidence that uh, uh, our model uh, is right. And this is the final scheme for this, uh, for this model, how, um, how it works and how it centers the chromosomes. So if the chromosome is here, uh, the kinetochores are displaced towards the left, we have a longer microtubule on the right side that has longer overlaps with both parallel microtubules of the bridging fiber and antiparallel ones. And now, if we have a spot labeled on the, on the bridging fiber, for example, here and here, these two spots will slide apart because the microtubule, the bridging microtubule is sliding apart. So this spot will, after some time, end up here, and this spot will end up here. It's just sliding apart. Now, the sliding forces from the kinetochore fiber are transmitted, uh, from the bridging fiber, are transmitted to the kinetochore fiber. But this, uh, this kinetochore fiber is more coupled to the bridging fiber because it's longer. So this uh, spot on the kinetochore fiber will move at a faster velocity towards the right side. Then this spot on here, on the kinetochore fiber here, this spot will move only a little bit to the left because there is more overlap and more coupling between the kinetochore fiber and the bridging fiber on the right side than on the left side. And this means that the effectively, the midpoint between the spots on the kinetochore fibers is moving to the right and helping to center kinetochores. And at the same time, we have all the other mechanisms working that I have shown you before. So for example, there is polymerization of microtubules on this side, which is also helping to center the kinetochores. But our model is that that the relative sliding of the kinetochore fibers with respect to the bridging fiber is, uh, provides a centering force that is helping to center uh, the kinetochores in the, in the metaphor scheme. And I think with this, I will have to finish. <laughs> I, I am now, uh, or maybe I can just show you, uh, I don't know, two most important slides of the uh, last parts of the talk, because there was a question about the bridging fiber during anaphase. So I have to say what happens to the bridging fiber during anaphase. This is the answer to the question about anaphase. So we, uh, we wanted to know about the bridging fiber during anaphase, and we uh, cut the kinetochore fiber here, which resulted in the movement of our kinetochores upwards. And now the anaphase starts. And you see, as the anaphase starts, the bridging fiber is still there. And in another experiment, we cut also the bridging fiber itself. So we cut first here, and then we cut the bridging fiber, and now the kinetochores didn't separate properly. You saw in the previous example that as long as the bridging fiber is there, the kinetochores separate properly. And now when you cut the bridging fiber, they don't separate properly. And um, what we think is happening is that the, the sliding in the bridging fiber, which we have shown that it's driven by egg five and mechanism four, kif four A, is helping to slide the kinetochore fibers apart. So this was the part about anaphase. And now I just have to introduce the part of the uh, spindle chirality that Menad will talk about uh, later in the, in the afternoon. So uh, uh, in this final part of the talk, I wanted to discuss the force balance in the whole spindle. And for this, we needed to know the shapes of the microtubules in the whole spindle. Now, if the microtubules were positioned like meridians on the Earth, then if you look at the spindle from pole to pole, you would see something like this. 
So all the microchip was starting from one point, radially going out and coming back to the other to the same point when you go to the towards the other pole. But what we saw in our experiment is that the microchips rotate. They show some kind of spiraling movement, some kind of rotation within the cell, within the spindle. So they are not just uh, simply uh, shaped like meridians or like a letter C in one plane, but they have helical shapes. And this is what we think is happening. So what we see is that the, the spindle has a chiral shape. The microtubules have a semi-helical shapes. They are twisted in the left-handed direction. And this is not so visible in the normal side view of the spindle because in the side view it looks like this. I mean, there is a little curvature, but nothing special. But it's the most visible if you look at the spindle end on, so pole to pole, then you see these kind of, if you would be able to follow the whole microtubule, it would look like a petal of a flower, but we are following just the central part. So what we saw in the movie well, is just, just this part. And this is a signature of the helical shape of the microtubules rather than straight shape. And Menad will tell you uh, uh, in the afternoon how these, uh, uh, how these helical shapes are generated by the bending and twisting moments. And with this, I will stop. Uh, and I'm looking forward to questions if we still have time. Yeah, thank you, Eva, and sorry to rush you. Uh, but we'll have time for a couple of quick questions, maybe. Uh, the first is from Sargata. Sargata, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah, thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, so as you, uh, hello, Eva, you showed that uh, in the optogenetic experiment, uh, the PRC1 detached from the overlapping microtubule and goes towards the membrane. And then when you put off the light, it comes back. But the half times were different. So my question is, uh, in the bulk after the detachment, how the PRC1, go, uh, what is the process through which the PRC1 goes towards the membrane and comes back? Is it by diffusion or by some active process? We, we think it's by diffusion. We think it's simply uh, that uh, PRC1 detaches, pro, uh, has a turnover. So there is some PRC1 in the cytoplasm and there is uh, some on the microtubules and it's turning over and simply the diffusion uh, is uh, moving into the membrane. That's, that's uh, what we think because uh, basically because we don't see any, any uh, directed movement of PRC1, we just see the signal of diffused PRC1 in the cytoplasm. But the half-life you have shown is different for two processes, going towards membrane and coming back. Uh, there is, uh, so uh, we think that, the, that the, uh, there, there is a binding affinity of PRC1 to the spindle, and then there is the affinity of SSPB towards SSR, SSRA that determine these, uh, these things, how, how fast it will unbind uh, from the microtubules and how fast uh, it will bind to the membrane. So it's determined by this. Diffusion, uh, opening up of uh, the changing of conformation is fast, but then there is, there is the, uh, uh, the three processes, diffusion and the binding affinity to the microtubules and the binding affinity to the membrane. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sakata. There's uh, maybe uh, one, Last question, uh, maybe from uh, Sapta Rishi. Uh, could you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah. Hi, Eva. So I have this question. So uh, in this chromosomal centering process, it is kind of the microtubule microtubule overlap length dependent. So I was wondering that should we expect any chromosomal oscillation at certain regimes due to the tug of war between leftward and uh, rightward forces? Just uh, in resemblance with the nuclear oscillations in the uh, fission east? Uh, okay, I didn't hear every word you said when you asked about oscillations. So uh, there are oscillations definitely in fission east and there are oscillations here. And we think that oscillations are driven mainly by the dynamics uh, of the microtubules. So uh, let me first say the, the forces that I explained them like this, they are simply centering. They don't drive. If you have a displaced chromosome, it, uh, it goes to the center and there are no oscillations uh, in this simplified view. 
But in real cells, the oscillations exist, uh, exist, and we think that they are driven by kinesinate motors that uh, that uh, accumulated at the plus end of the microtubules. In fission yeast, it's clear that it's driven by uh, kinesinate and microtubule dynamics because fission yeast doesn't undergo forward uh, flux. There is no sliding of microtubules towards the uh, ends of the spindle in yeast. This means that this kind of model cannot work because the kinetochore fibers cannot slide with respect to uh, uh, yeah. Over, yeah. overlapping yeah. bridging microtubules. So in fission yeast, the oscillations and everything of the centering is exclusively driven by the dynamics of the plus end that is uh, regulated by kinesinate and other motors. And here you have both effects. The motors like kinesinate are influencing the dynamics and generating the oscillations. And there is this sliding effect that is purely centering. Does this answer okay. the good question? Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, the, okay, one last question from Weber, who's got his hands up. Um, yeah. Weber, uh, so ahead. just. Yeah, just a quick, uh, quick question. Uh, when you talked about microtube, you know, when you talked about molecular motors, they're basically enabling uh, uh, depolymerization. I didn't understand the mechanism uh, unless you said it and I, I missed it. What was the mechanism behind motors actually increasing the probability of depolymerization of the microtubules? Uh, I, I didn't say this, and this is a, this is also a great question. Uh, so there are several models. Uh, in one model, the, for example, the, the motors go to the plus end and they physically grab the subunits of the microtubule, the dimers. They bind to the dimers and they detach them. Uh, motors can also uh, uh, change the conformation of the plus end, promote the change of the conformation of the plus end. But I think the first, mo the first model in which the motors really uh, detach the subunits from the, from the plus end is the uh, most accepted, at least for kinesinate. Yeah, because that wouldn't explain like some linear growth, right? I mean, you had like depolymerization increasing with the length of the filament. And in case length of the filament is correlated to the number of motors, then motors just going towards the plus end, that wouldn't explain uh, this uh, correlation, right? This explains the, uh, do you mean, just a second. You no, mean- uh, Longer filament depolymerize faster because of the motors. Yeah, this was this is the depolymerization rate was seen in experiments to de depend on microtubule length, and uh, this was for stabilized microtubules. So, uh, meaning these microtubules don't undergo dynamic instability by themselves; they are just stabilized. And the interpretation is: the more motors on the plus end, they really take off the subunits, and the more motors there are, the more subunits they take, and there is the higher depolymerization rate. But this is, uh, this is slightly different than what is seen in cells. But at least for in vitro experiments, this is the case. Thank you, Eva, and thanks, Weber.